Hello, good uh, good day, everyone. Welcome to our welcome to our uh, well week three meeting uh, about inquiry based learning this time, and we are progressing on through our five pedagogies to consider those items that uh, you may want to look at for application in your classroom and for application in a final project. The idea of inquiry is about asking questions. It's questioning. And through these questions that we ask students, whether they are very broad questions or they become very narrow questions, it is our attempt to get students to higher order thinking. And uh, we have to do some planning around that, and we have to do so have some very good strong assessment around, around that. So we are considering this uh, as developing learning around the ability for students to process that question, process the information related to it, and also to help them with their problem solving skills. But this is a little bit different from problem based learning in the point of view that we take it from. You see, we could look at the same subject in different ways. We could approach it as a problem to solve. We could look at it as a case. And we can look at it as a set of questions. Likely, students may uh, have different results depending upon uh, the, the situation that, we, that uh, we set up for them. And so our assessment here has to be not only the content that we want students to learn, and how they understand it, as well as how they get there. Uh, perhaps it's the information skills that we want them to come away with. Perhaps it, they are technical skills. Perhaps uh, movie making is part of the inquiry, where they're going to report back through a video or a presentation or some other mode. So we would need assessment of those, as well as the content that they are learning. So some good strong rubrics as well as uh, perhaps uh, some other means to uh, assess this content learning. Now interestingly enough, uh, inquiry-based learning does not necessarily have to be in dispersed settings like we, we might think where students go away in small groups and learn and question and work and we sit in and we come back. Uh, inquiry can also be used in teacher-directed lessons, in large group settings. So we can approach, we can approach this uh, from, a, from a classroom perspective, too, doing inquiry. And we have some questions for which we could ask students, and some different kinds of questions for which we could ask students to do this. So. I want you to stop the recording momentarily and uh, answer this, quest this, this question, uh, how is inquiry-based learning different from case-based learning and problem-based learning? So please stop the video now on the slider at the bottom and answer the question in the discussion link. That is linked in the wiki. Now, these questions can be asked in several different ways. We can ask students to infer. We can ask students to infer uh, what, what the, if it's a uh, writing, what the author uh, is telling us. The, the clues are likely within the content of the story. And what inferences uh, can we make from that? What suppositions can we make for that? What can we fill in by connecting those dots? We could also do the same thing with photographs, uh, such as the perspective. Where is the camera? What's the camera view? The time of day? The setting? The lighting? What else is the, what is the photographer in trying to get us to infer from the view? And, or uh, in artwork? In movie making, uh, filmmaking, what 
what can we infer from what the uh, director, uh, the uh, the director, the the producer of these films or photographs or plays or works of art or uh, writing. What can we infer from those? What can we connect together? Uh, that what can we connect to the important concepts that are there that will allow us to infer uh, ideas from that? What can we interpret? What kind of interpretation questions can we ask students? These these questions are consequences. Uh, interpretations of concepts, in, concepts or interpretations of ideas. So we want students to make interpretations of the consequences. So uh, it could be in the sense of consequences of the book. Uh, if we were to ask, uh, for example, uh, um, about a movie maker and that movie maker uh, never made a certain kind of movie, uh, how could what interpretation could we take to a different setting for a movie maker or an author? Um, if Stephen King were writing humor, uh, maybe he is writing humor, but if he were really a humor writer, uh, what kinds of stories would he tell us? What what kind of stand-up jokes would Stephen King tell us if he were uh, a comedian? Uh, if he were a filmmaker, he does write for film, or some of his works are in film. What would he tell us in his in his films? If he were a musician, what kinds of songs would Stephen King write? So if we could ask him to interpret, or what kind of love song would Stephen King write? Um, it would be an interesting uh, interpretation of the style of writer that uh, Stephen King happens to write about or happens happens to be. The next type of question is about transfer. If we ask students to take their former learning and to put it into a new setting or a different setting. So if we, they have learned some principles, uh, scientific principles, geographic principles, writing principles, uh, reading principles, and now let's put that in a new setting and let's have them look, let's have them look um, at the new setting uh, with questioning what they questioning that setting about what they already know about that setting so in this image uh, that's associated with this picture we're coming out into a new setting through a tunnel into a new setting taking our principles there and asking students then to apply these concepts these principles in uh, these new and different settings and the last one is a scientific question. It's about questions about hypotheses that can truly be tested scientifically, where students have ideas that they can go out and collect data about, whether that data is making actual measurements, uh, making observations, collecting that observations, um, and systematically looking at them, whether uh, these observations are in hard numbers, in graphs, in charts, or they are descriptions of scenes. Descriptions of scenes is that qualitative data where we could make some interpretation of that data that they are collecting. So we have these different types of questions. They can be asked in small group settings. They can be asked in large group settings. And the, and the setting is driven by questions that we are asking, uh, asking our students. So our next question here is to choose one of these types of questions about inquiry-based and write an inquiry-based question, an um, inquiry-based learning question uh, for one of the subjects for your students. So whether you are teaching primary or whether you're teaching high school or in between, what type of inquiry base can you ask your students even though it's early in the year, what kind of question could you ask them uh, that would allow them to do one of those items, whether it's scientific, it's a transfer question, or some of those other questions, interpretation uh, types of questions. And you choose the subject, uh, you choose the area that you would ask your students to drive inquiry-based learning. Stop the recording. Now, what we are trying to achieve here are some different 
uh, thresholds of learning than we are typically than we are typically looking looking at. So these these inquiry based strategies allow us to guide learning and thinking and questioning. And there's this notion of deep learning. You may have heard of this notion. It, it is one of these emerging statements by reformers. I'm, although I'm not sure it is actually part of the reform movement, some of them are using this. So we, we can make a comparison between deep, deep learning for students and surface learning for, for students. So in the studies of deep uh, of deep learning, you can see some bullet points there uh, that are uh, associated with the with the idea of of deep learning, um, and that is uh, perhaps a student wrote their own study questions, uh, or uh, the student took the process and in their own way broke it down step by step, perhaps sketching it out, making notes, making an outline. So digging deeper into the process is this idea of of deep learning. And compared to this notion of surface learning, which is which is what is perceived is going on in our schools, mainly driven by rote learning. I'm going to make index cards. I'm going to memorize these cards, uh, or I highlighted the text, uh, or I you know, I looked over the notes before I came to class today. So the idea of this notion of deep learning is to look look deep, look critically. Uh, and to look, look critically at these new facts and working with them in what learning students are doing already. And in, in a sense, part of this is the constructive, constructivist model that lots of the school reformers reject, but they are jumping on this term deeper learning uh, to attempt to discount uh, what's occurring in, in, the typical, in the typical school. And also in this deep learning concept, we're making links. So in this notion of surface learning, uh, the ideas are looked at, they're accepted, they're isolated, and they're really unconnected from any other type of, of learning. So the deep learning, the surface learning, we are trying to cover, we're trying to get through material. So on the deep learning side, we're going to go back and forth between deep learning and surface learning and contrast the two. So in the deep learning, we are looking for meaning. On the surface learning side, it's rote learning. In some cases, we have to rote. I have I had to rote learn my multiplication tables. And in the deeper learning side, we are looking at concepts that will help, help us approach bigger issues whether it's through cases, problems, inquiry, the no, those, those particular notions as we're looking at bigger, bigger issues. In the surface learning, we're sort of looking at the formula. What formula do I need to solve this problem? What, you know, what can I put in the numbers, uh, say in algebra, in an algebraic equation, and plug and chug, I know this number is A, I know this number is B, I number, know this number is C, and it gives me an answer so I can solve so I can solve the problem. We're talking about learning interactively with deeper learning. And in surface learning we're talking about passively, passive learning. In deeper learning we are we distinguish between an argument and evidence. Sometimes wherever the setting is, the person who speaks the loudest tends to be correct or perceived to be correct. Uh, so uh, the argument, uh, the, con the, the argument here and the evidence, what evidence do we have for what we are learning? What's, what evidence happens to be there? In surface learning, there's some difficulty telling the difference between the forest and the trees. So distinguishing principles and examples is, is a challenge. In deeper learning, we're attempting to make connections. We want to put everything together. Everything together is interconnected in some way. It works together. So whether it's across lessons, across days and weeks, or units across months and years, making these connections are part of the deep learning uh, idea. And 
in surface learning, it is really looking at things that are uh, independent and separate. And it is interesting uh, if you reflect back and look, look deep enough into that. Uh, that word was not meant to be facetious here. But if you, if you scratched a little bit farther into the, the blended learning uh, notion of Staker and Horn and Christensen, uh, you will interestingly see them talk about being able to separate programmed instruction and separate modules making them stand by themselves um, in, in a curriculum so that uh, units can be plugged in and out. And so while the school reformers here are speaking out of two sides, they're speaking out of the fact that we have too much in interdependence in our schools, that it's not modular enough, they are all also looking at the impacts of deeper learning. And I think this is a perception that we don't do deeper learning in, in our schools, uh, but these are the terms that are being tossed uh, that are being tossed about. Of course, relating new and previous knowledge, this notion of old and new, the old windmill versus the new windmill, relating them all together, how they're similar, how they're different, why they're important uh, in both settings, and the the surface learning is the new material. We don't recognize it that it is something important related to the previous work. And we, we tend to see this in a math or a science, but it's also across writing. It's, it's across everything that we do where we are building upon what's developmentally appropriate for our children and, and moving that along uh, across, across the years. And here in deep learning, we are, we are trying to connect content to reality. And with the surface notion, it is, OK, we've got an exam coming up to take, and we need to get you ready for it, whether it is a common formative assessment that we all need to administer, whether it is an end of year common assessment, or it's one of those standardized test scores. We're trying to get you ready for that. Um, and then we'll be done with this, and we can, we can move on to the, next, to the next piece. The other part of this, uh, of this uh, week we are looking at some ideas of augmented reality. And this is where we can take computer graphics and we can overlay them on to real world environments. Uh, you're seeing some of this occur uh, with, uh, for, for example, your uh, evening weather forecast is done this way, where there's a map and then real-time computer graphics is overlaid on top of that map, whether it's real radar data or whether that data happens to be uh, a prediction map of what's coming up. So we have these, these computer graphic overlays. This is also emerging in other places. For example, it is emerging for us in education. Um, and it's also emerging in advertising. Interestingly enough, uh, you can try on virtually a pair of Ray-Ban glasses. Um, and so if you go to their website there, I, I have it linked on this slide, uh, you can uh, turn on your camera. Uh, notice the terms of use. They're very small print. I'm not sure I can read them all, but uh, note, note, read what the terms of use are. And you can virtually try on and see yourself in a pair of Ray-Bans and even buy them off the site. So, so try it, or, or try something else of, of some sort of augmented reality, where it takes uh, a real picture of something and overlays computer graphics on top of that, real, of that real setting. There's a lot of things going on with Google Maps, where real-time data uh, is overlaid on Google Maps. We sometimes see that with traffic, but there, there are attempts that to actually uh, show you individual bits of traffic, the cars and the trucks, people walking down streets, people playing on playgrounds, uh, some of that augmented reality on, on Google Maps. And here is a bit of advertising uh, that can be used to sell products, uh, what you might look like wearing clothes or with a different hairstyle, or in this case, buy yourself a pair of sunglasses. So in the final question here, we have for you is to, of these three pedagogies that we've looked at so far, case-based, problem-based, and now inquiry-based, for your students, 
which one of these three pedagogies probably has the best application for you. If they're all of equal weight or you don't know, um, take, take a shot at one of them. Uh, and, and tell us why. I'm, I'm trying to get you to make a decision here real soon about which pedagogy you're leaning toward uh, for your final project because we want to start working on that in our week four meeting uh, in the computer lab where we can start to do that. So I'm going to end this session, uh, this recording, by having you answer this question. And we will catch up with you during the week. Thank you.